by now this is a story that we all know pretty well, but it's not actually a story that's based on a whole lot of fossil evidence, at least the details of this story. And that's because there are very few places in the world where there's a good, well-dated fossil record of dinosaurs up to a Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, and then a good record of mammals afterwards. Most of those places are in Western North America, because there's a number of sedimentary basins across the West that have rocks and fossils of this age. And some of these are quite well known, some of these more northerly basins where the Hell Creek formation crops out. And these have received the vast majority of study. But I'm going to talk today about the record from another basin, a more southerly basin, that hasn't received so much study but has a pretty interesting story to tell. And that's the San Juan Basin down in the state of New Mexico. It is a gorgeous part of the world, badlands topography, candy-striped uh, mudstones and sandstones that were laid down in rivers and lakes and in swamps. Beautiful place to do field work. But the real importance of it is the age of these rocks, because in the San Juan Basin, we have Cretaceous Age rocks. We have a thick sandstone, it's called the Ojo Alamo Sandstone, that more or less uh, records the KPG boundary. And then after that, we have Paleogene rocks, and in particular, a formation called the Nascimento Formation that's from the Paleocene, the very earliest part of the Paleogene. The Cretaceous rocks full of dinosaurs. Normal cast of characters from the late Cretaceous. And the Nascimento formation of the Paleocene full of mammals. And really important mammals because these mammals give us one of the best pictures from anywhere in the world of those first mammal faunas that were established <coughs> after the extinction. And because of that, these Nascimento faunas are the type faunas of many of the most important early divisions of that Nalva time scale of mammal evolution. But they're also really important for another reason, and that's an evolutionary reason. These mammals are rising up around the time that placentals are. They probably have a lot to do with the origin of placentals in the major subgroups. So this is something we don't understand very well. We know quite a bit about those mammals that live with the dinosaurs. We know quite a bit about those mammals that came a little bit later in the Paleogene. This is when the first fossils of most of the major uh, mammal groups, placental groups, show up in the fossil record. But we still don't know a whole lot about those early Paleogene mammals. We have really no clear idea of their phylogenetic relationships. And that's a problem because these are the mammals living in the first 10 million years after the extinction. So they hold the key to solving what's become a pretty big debate in the field over the last few decades. And that's this question of whether mammals, particularly placentals, explosively diversified after the dinosaurs were cleared out, or whether their rise was slower, more gradual, started long before the extinction, or maybe it was somewhere in between. So these kind of big questions have piqued my interest in mammals, coming from the dinosaur side to the mammal side, and they've piqued the interest of a lot of my colleagues as well. So over the last few years, a bunch of us have come together to work in the San Juan Basin on this NSF project, and we've basically taken it as our mission to dissect the record of this basin to see what it tells us about the Cretaceous Paleogene transition. So the first thing we've done is uh, look at the geochronology, because we want to pin down the ages of the rocks, and figure out their correlations to the global time scale. So this part of the project largely has been led by uh, Matt Heisler at New Mexico Tech and Dan Pepe at Baylor University. We have a lot of new ash dates and detrital sanidine dates, and I just want to draw your attention briefly to two of them that constrain the boundary. So we dated now the latest Cretaceous dinosaurs in the San Juan Basin, and they turn out to be really, really really latest Cretaceous. They are within 300,000 years of the boundary. That makes them some of the youngest, well-dated, non-avian dinosaurs from anywhere in the world. And they're a very diverse lot of dinosaurs there. All the major subgroups are there, so that speaks to this idea that these dinosaurs were relatively diverse, pretty healthy, until they were struck down suddenly by the asteroid. Now we also have some dates on the other side of the boundary, and one of these dates helps constrain the first mammal faunas. And in particular, uh, this mammal fauna called the Puerkin II fauna. And that's what's widely considered to be the first stable, diverse mammal fauna after the extinction. The disaster species are gone. We now have a range of mammals from shrew-sized things up to cow-sized things, a lot of different diets and behaviors, some of the things that you saw in Gemma's talk. 
these mammals also turn out to be really close to the boundary within 350,000 years. So that speaks to just how quickly mammals established themselves and radiated after the asteroid went down the dinosaur. So we're building this time scale now. And so along with that, we're of course collecting a lot of fossils to slot into this time scale. So we've been collecting a whole bunch of these mysterious early uh, paleogene mammals, these things with virtually unknown phylogenetic relationships. We have some new taxa like this thing, Kimbatopsilus, that we named last year, this beaver-sized uh, plant eater that lived just a couple hundred thousand years after the extinction. We've been finding new specimens, of very rare types of things like Wardmania here, similar to that very strange Stilinodon that Gemma showed. This is called a Taniodon. These were burrowing mammals, uh, mammals kind of like um, badgers. And we've also been collecting quite a lot of fossils of a mammal that looks like it was very common in the San Juan Basin. And this is this animal called Periptychus. It's a condylar, so it's a member of this uh, very notorious, uh, infamous, wastebasket group of mammals that we don't really know much of anything about their phylogeny, but it's pretty widely considered that some of them have something to do with the origins of the modern hoofed mammal groups. And so this work has been led largely by my PhD student in Edinburgh, Sarah Shelley, who's finishing up this year. And Sarah's monographing Periptychus, so we've learned quite a bit about what this animal was like. It was about the size of a dog, very robust, very stocky, uh, bulbous teeth that it used to eat tough vegetation. So we're getting a picture of this animal. What, what we're really doing is using Periptychus as something of a Rosetta Stone, uh, for lack of a better term, to try to untangle, to start to untangle the phylogenetic relationships and the paleobiology of these mammals. So one thing we're doing is we're starting to build a big data set, putting these early paleogene mammals into the context of the Cretaceous mammals that came before them and the more modern groups that came afterwards. And we're, this is really early days here. We're just getting started. Um, the details of this tree aren't very important. We're building and building and building it, and the details will change. But what we are finding is that there's a lot of monophyletic clusters of these early paleogene groups that are dispersed across the mammal family tree, and a lot of them are very close to the base of placentals and seem to be on the stem to some of the major modern groups. Another thing we're doing is looking at the paleobiology of these animals, and I'll just highlight one of the things that we've been up to, and that is we're looking at locomotion. There's a lot of data for modern mammals, been published by Matt Carano and others, uh, linking limb proportions to locomotion style. So we can run multivariate analyses and get a morphospace like this uh, in which a bunch of mammals are plotted. We have one main axis there that's basically a body size axis. We have the other axis, a locomotion axis, where the mammals uh, span from the stockiest, most robust gravel portal things on the bottom to the fastest, longest limbed cursorial species on the top. And when we put some of these early paleogene mammals into this morphospace, space, we see that they occupy their own region of that space. They are much more gravicordal than any of the modern mammals. So that's indicating that these were pretty interesting, maybe specialized mammals in their own right. They weren't just some boring ancestral stock that the modern mammals came from. So we're working a lot on this. But we're doing more than just um, you know, the anatomy and paleobiology uh, and phylogenetics work. We're also doing some broader scale macroevolutionary work. And that's because we have a lot of data. So for the last 20 years or so, my colleague Tom Williamson of uh, the New Mexico Museum of Natural History has been collecting in the basin. This has just ramped up over the last few years with our uh, collaborative project. And so right now we have a database of over 15,000 mammal specimens from the basin that we can use to look at trends in evolution and diversification over the first four billion years after the asteroid hit. And so we're able to divide these mammals into eight local biozones. And if we look, for instance, at just a few things I'll go through quickly, species richness, we see it's quite high very early on in those Puerto and two faunas, 350,000 years or less after the extinction. And then it kind of fluctuates around and then it reaches peak local diversity about three to four million years after the extinction in the time after the Puerican, which is called the Torahonian. And this is robust to um, sample size differences. We see something similar with turnover rates. So it's fluctuation over those four million years, but a big spike in rates in the Torahonian. 
And that's because there's a bunch of new species originating and there's lots of extinction in that time as well. So this Torahonian time, three to four million years after the extinction, is a pretty dynamic time in mammal evolution. And that begs the question of what might possibly be causing that. There's a lot of possibilities, of course, but we suspect that it has something to do with climate. And that's another aspect of our project. We're looking at how climate, temperature, precipitation, and environments changed over those four million years in the basin. This is work that's largely being spearheaded by Ross Secord of the University of Nebraska. We know from the marine record, and also a growing terrestrial record, that the Paleogene was a time of very high temperatures, but also a time of very volatile temperatures. And there were a bunch of uh, what are called hyperthermals. These are transient global warming events. The most famous of these is the PETM at the Paleocene-Eocene boundary. But there were also a bunch of them earlier in the Paleocene, including one during that Torahonian time slice called the Lake Damien event. We see this in the San Juan Basin. We see this big negative carbon isotope excursion. It marks that Lake Damien event. And we see another one a little bit earlier in time. So we think, we suspect that these have something to do with the turnover, but we still have to pin down the timings a little bit more precisely. But it's not just the turnover that these hyperthermals might be affecting. When we look at body size in one of the most common mammals in the basin that spans throughout much of this time, we see that there was a significant decrease in its body size in or near that late Damien event. So that's interesting because something similar has been recognized at the PETM with some mammals, that there's a decrease in size as temperatures heat up. So maybe this is something more general, which of course has relevance for today. So we're continuing to look into this. So that's just a very <laughs> brief whirlwind of this project. Really the most important points. We have very, very late surviving dinosaurs and some of the first mammals that came afterwards. There was a lot of activity around the boundary. These mammals rose up quickly. Some of these early paleogene mammals seem to have been very interesting animals. Figuring out their phylogeny is really going to be the linchpin. Looking at big scale evolutionary trends, we see high species richness early on, not too long after the extinction. We see a lot of turnover. That really peaks about three or four million years later. That might, we think, have something to do with climate. So just to close and to circle back to those big hypotheses that I mentioned at the beginning, one basin isn't, of course, going to solve this long-standing debate about how mammals rose up, but we would argue that what we're seeing in the San Juan Basin is most consistent with that hypothesis that mammals very quickly, explosively diversified after the dinosaurs went extinct, and that's what set the stage for the rise of the and ultimately for us. So thank you very much. <laughs>